So I'm responsible for writing all this, and I don't believe it anymore. Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak again. Uh, I'll really be talking about low carbohydrate diets and how I changed my understanding that you should be eating from high carbohydrates to low carbohydrates. So it's a bit of about mea culpa, I was wrong and I apologize. But actually, if you look at the evidence, I'll try to explain why it looked so obvious that you have to eat carbohydrates. So if you went back to the literature in 1939, I wonder if someone could find a pointer for me at some stage. It seems to have disappear uh, disappeared. Steve stole it. That's a okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my personal. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. So here's a study in 1939 in which a group were put on a low-carbohydrate diet or a high-carbohydrate diet, and what you observe is on the low-carbohydrate diet, they're burning mainly fat, but they could only last for 60 minutes, by which time their blood glucose had fallen. So if you read that paper in 1939, you'd assume that a high-carbohydrate diet was absolutely critical for your performance. And the same guys did the next experiment that they took people until they stopped exercising. At this point, they were exhausted. They were given 200 grams of glucose. And you can see the blood glucose rose, and these people were able to continue. And this person's oxygen consumption actually rose up, showing that they actually increased the exercise capacity. So when we got involved in this carbohydrate story, we went and looked for the great scientists who'd done this work. And so we would quote, like David Dill was one of the great scientists of all time, and he said the ingestion of a heavy carbohydrate meal a few hours before the marathon race and a supply of glucose before and during the race are logical. So we thought, my gosh, we discovered this. You know, this is these great scientists saying we must eat lots of carbohydrate. And the first conference I ever went to was in, in New York City, and it was the New York Academy of Sciences. And the leading authority on glucose metabolism during exercise was a chap called Warren. And he presented these data and he showed that if you exercise for a long time, for 240 minutes, your blood glucose concentration will tend to fall. And he said the reason is because your muscles, at, at, at rest, the muscles take up less glucose than the liver is producing. But during exercise, the rate of glucose uptake increases and it increases further, but the rate of glucose released by the liver goes up and then goes down. So at this point, the blood glucose must fall because you're producing less glucose than the muscles are taking up. So therefore, we all knew now carbohydrates are clearly crit critically important. What's really interesting at this conference in 1977, no one mentioned fluids during exercise at all. At all. We didn't think that you needed to take ex uh, fluids during exercise. It took a long time before the modern scientists could come and show that you needed carbohydrate during exercise. And Ed Coyle wrote, did this publication in 1986. He took a group and he fasted them for 12 hours before the experiment. And then he had the one group take 100 grams of carbohydrate per hour for, four, for three hours. And the, the, sorry, that was that group. So they ate the 100 grams of carbohydrate per hour for four hours. This group had a placebo, and you'll notice that they stopped early. And their carbohydrate oxidation goes down, and their muscle glycogen use is pretty much the same. And this group, even though their, glu their glycogens are equally low, they're able to exercise for longer, suggesting that it was the blood glucose that was slowing them down. And so this was the final evidence we all needed to say that you must take a lot of carbohydrate before you exercise, so that you stuff your muscles with glycogen, and you must take lots of carbohydrate during exercise. And that is the predominant model that we are still teaching. At people, if you go to the Ironman triathlon, you will see that athletes are taking 100 grams an hour during the marathon, and probably during the cycle as well, 100 grams an hour. And it comes from this type of study. At the time, I was working with one of our great runners, Chapel Bruce Fordyce, who won the Comrades Marathon nine times, and we're going to talk about him a bit later. And he said, it's not possible for me to run a long-distance race without ingesting a high-carbohydrate drink, especially for the last few hours of the race. And together, we developed the first goo in the world, and it was called Fordyce, Rose, and Noakes, FRN. So we produced that product that is currently widely used. The Scandinavians, meantime, at the, just before, had developed the muscle biopsy technique where they would put a biopsy needle in the muscle and take out a bit of glycogen, or sorry, muscle and measure its glycogen content. 
and they said you see here if you are on a high carbohydrate diet you start with much more glycogen in the muscle and you can burn it and you go on for longer whereas if you need a low carbohydrate diet of the kind that we're promoting you start with less glycogen in the muscle and you get tired very quickly and your blood glucose drops as well and your respiratory quotient would be low so you're burning fat so what did we conclude we concluded that if you're burning fat you can't burn it fast enough to keep you going and that was the conclusion and then we had this classic paper which took a group who were on the low carbohydrate diet which is a five percent the finny diet and look how badly they did they couldn't last at all, whereas the group eating the high carbohydrate diet lasted for much longer. So you can understand why in the 1980s it was very difficult to get up and say, you must eat fat. We have to say carbohydrates because we had all the evidence. And we did a, a bucket of research. We did 10 years or 15 years of research and we did some of these studies. And here's a typical one where we measured glycogen use during exercise in people who are carbohydrate loaded or they were not carbohydrate loaded. And you can see again that with carbohydrate loading you start with much more glycogen and you last for longer. And we noticed there were a couple of guys who stopped early and, and as predicted they had low glycogen which was exactly what we expected. So the mod this proved the model. If you did add too little glycogen in your muscles you would stop. And so if in the 1970s you'd read the literature it said depletion of the endogenous, carbo endogenous carbohydrate stores has been shown to be a limiting factor in the ability to perform long-term exercise and that is a conclusion ladies and gentlemen which you cannot draw you cannot draw that conclusion because that's association and association does not prove causation there are two events happening at the same time they do not prove causation but if you went even further a little bit later in 1987 Connolly reviewed the literature and he said when muscle glycogen runs out the muscle fails from lack of ATP production However plausible and attractive theory is, it's unproven, and that, that's correct. And then he says, what is clear is that in glycogen depleted muscle, ATP is being used up faster than can be manufactured, and so force output is diminished. Now that is a complete poor, bad conclusion. It's completely wrong. Because if you run out of ATP, what happens, the muscle goes into rigor and cannot move. So if, a, if ATP is being used up faster than it can be manufactured, muscle rigor must occur causing death and the termination of exercise. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that you laughed indicates you watched a lot of races and that's never happened. So that, that model doesn't work at all. So you see what the model was, it's this, that you have a certain ATP requirement during exercise and we know that your muscle glycogen use must go down because you must ultimately run out of glycogen. So the argument would be that you run along and you burn more and more fat, more and more fat until you reach your maximum fat oxidation rate and when you reach that, reach that maximum rate you have to develop an ATP deficit. So if you continue to run at that speed the outcome must be rigor. That's the only outcome. And so we know that doesn't happen, so clearly we don't understand what the reality is. But what does happen is that you might reduce your exercise intensity and then your ATP production rate will be fine. And this is exactly what happens or the way the body is designed. The body is designed because we have a brain to make sure that we don't damage ourselves during exercise. And so what would happen if this was real? you would slow down if you reached a maximum rate of fat oxidation. You would actually slow down. And so this model would explain why you get tired and you don't get into rigor. So it's important to remember that the brain regulates exercise performance. And that's part of my other research to absolutely show that. That the brain will always be getting information back from the muscles and if they were at risk of running out of ATP you would just slow down. They'd tell the brain stop. So as a result of all this research, of 20 years of our own research, and, and this is now continued because who's the main funder of exercise research? People who make carbohydrate products. So 99% of the researchers in the field are dependent for funding on the carbohydrate industry. Okay? As I was when we were doing the research. So when we draw, this is a diagram I drew up maybe 10 years ago, 
And, and what it shows is the whole focus of getting glucose to the muscle to produce energy. So we make you eat and drink lots of carbohydrate. We stuff the muscle, the, the liver with glycogen. We stuff the muscles with glycogen. And then even the muscles that you aren't using, for example, the arms can produce lactate and that can produce energy. And we think we really got it all right because this is how you exercise. And the elephant in the room goes missing. So what's the elephant in the room? The elephant in the room is that. Can you see that this is a diagram I drew up 10 years ago? Where's the focus? It's all on carbohydrate. But the carbohydrate stores are limited. But you've got so much fat in the muscle or in the body and we just ignored it as if it doesn't exist. Can you believe the brainwashing that we had gone through to do that? <laughs> so, so we just ignored this as if it wasn't important. If you liked this video, please subscribe and share this video on social media and consider donating to my Ko-Fi account.